Okay, so today we have with us Sirith Sohi. Uh, she's an NBA reporter based in Toronto. She joined Yahoo Sports in 2018, and she previously covered the NBA for SB Nation. Thanks a lot, Sirith, for participating. Um, you're our first sports reporter. Oh, cool. Yeah, so, uh, okay. so we'll, we'll get started right away. Um, Sirith, what's your superpower, and how did you come to identify it? My superpower? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I have a superpower. Well, but what you excel at like a lot, like you're in the one percent of. There must be something. In the one percent of that's an interesting question. Um, well, I guess I mean I wouldn't say I'm in the one percent, but I always had I I was always good at writing. Mm -hmm. like even going back to being like in elementary school, it was like reading and writing. It was like you know. Do you remember when? they would tell you what grade level you were doing things at when you were in school. Okay. Or maybe they did that in Alberta. Yeah, I think our, I think our, our school systems are probably slightly different. But yeah. like when they had, anytime they had like those provincial tests or like oh, yeah. some of the, like the, the, the standardized tests that they do for everybody, like after you would find out where you stood amongst like what amongst your grade and for reading reading comprehension writing I would always be like a grade or two up so mm -hmm. I guess yeah I get I guess I've always I've always had that and mm -hmm. then you know down the line obviously when I started to pursue it as a career um actually being able to to consider a craft and, and improve upon it I think uh I think I just had a knack for it what makes a effective writer uh particularly when in this era especially because particularly in your industry it's a lot of clickbait right like i don't i just go on reddit and read the headline so uh oh. what in, in in that kind of sphere what makes an effective writer i need well i need you to click the article dude I will, I will. <laughs> zach lowe's oh. my guy zach lowe's one of the few guys whose articles i click but then it's it's like generational because i've been reading him since grantland mm -hmm. you know I mean? so it's now it's like okay i gotta start clicking more more links. But yeah. Zach, Zach is great. I think Zach is a great example of what makes a good writer. Uh, but I would say like, it's honestly pretty, it's simple, but I think people don't, I, it's honestly, it's honestly like deceptively simple. I think it's just reading a lot more okay. than anything else. Um, and reading on the topic that you're, that you're going to write about, it'll inspire you. And it's also information. Like you want to make sure that you're telling the truth and having the most possible context that you can so just read you know or or whatever it is like whatever, wherever it is that you get your information from like make sure you're doing that but if you're writing you definitely need to be getting that from what you read just because it will make you a better writer just like reading people who are good authors like they are able to formulate like complex complex thoughts so they're they're tight they you know, they understand how to communicate. Mm -hmm. I think that is probably the biggest thing. Um, and then, you know, just aside from that, it's like trust your own gut. It's mm -hmm. like everybody, I, I think when, because there's so much content out there, I think people find themselves in a rush to like think of the right thing to say within, you know, whatever the context of what, like, you know, what's going on in media on a specific day. Um, I just feel like that can kind of be counterproductive sometimes just because everyone's writing now. There's so much content. You can't like, you want to be, a, if you, if you're one of those people that like has a very defined niche, that's great. But I think for the most part, like it's better to just go and like, you know, just dive in and go with what you're thinking and don't be afraid that other people are, are thinking about the same thing. I, I think a lot of people get caught in just trying to be different when well, like, it's not really, it's not really about the idea anymore. I, I think as much as it's about the execution. Mm -hmm. um, for the audience now, it's tricky because I don't know if this was the case 20 years ago. Maybe it was, but even within sports, you have like, like guys like Nick Wright, you know, yeah. super LeBron guys. And then you have super Kobe guys. For someone who's reading an article, how do you identify trigger words where it's like, or trigger form where it's like, okay, this is filled with bias. I should stay away from this. Is there a way you can like filter or is that impossible? 
Well, you can filter. I think I think it's all about using your own judgment. Like like Nick Wright is is a great example, I think, because like obviously he's a LeBron guy. He says he's a LeBron guy, but he's also like very smart and makes good points and like does a ton of research. So you can still you can use that stuff and not have to feel about LeBron the way that Nick Wright does. But I think in sports, it's generally very obvious. I think most people are pretty okay with saying that they're on a specific side. I think it's actually like, I don't know, like there's, there's two schools of thought, thought, thought to it, I think, where some people try to be very, very unbiased and like put on that image. And I think that a lot of the times it's really a performance because at the end of the day, it's sports and like the way that our brains function we're always going to take a side. So I just try to be cognizant of it, even like in my own writing. And there's, there are specific athletes that, that I like. And if I like a specific athlete, then I'm going to write about them more and I'm going to write nice things about them because that's just the nature of the thing. Mm-hmm. Um, especially like, especially when it's like something that's just on the court. To me, that's just not serious enough to worry about like, oh, like what if I'm like 25% biased towards Seth Curry? Like, well, yeah, I probably am. And mm-hmm. that's okay because that's the point, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously, like when you get into the more more serious stuff, you have to take a step back and and think about it in a more objective way. But I think it's pretty easy to tell. Like I think a lot of people are actually like very open about the fact that they're a fan of a specific thing, or you can just tell by like 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 one of the things that I think. I mean, it's a theme that's explored in a lot of in a lot of different um, art and like movies and like whatever. But like the idea that what you what you give attention to is also what you love is i think um very true and i think it really applies to any content that you make so there's almost an inherent bias that's inevitable in in sports content creation that i don't know i try to honestly just not think about it too much i don't think it's that big of a deal i think it's probably it probably makes better stuff if you get into it how do you, um, particularly now with like um, Twitter and blogs and Reddit, how do you differentiate yourself from other writers? Like, okay, obviously your content has to stand out, but how do you guys, how do you get someone to read a Sirat Sohi piece over and over again consistent, consistently? Because back in the day you had, I remember like there's this one old guy who used to write for Fox and he would write in like bullet points. His name was like, he was like a big Phil Jackson guy. I don't know if you know, remember his name. I'm escaping his name. But like even Zach Lowe, he has the 10 things I love, yada, yada, yada. So yeah. how, do you, how do you differentiate so yourself from everyone else and get people to consistently come and read? Well, I'm still working on that. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I don't have a flagship column or anything like that yet. Um, we've tried a couple of things that like, you know, some things worked, some, some, some things didn't. Um, so for me, it's still, I'm still very much in that process, but I'm just trying to find things like, find pattern things that suit me um mm-hmm. like for example Zach's 10 things are, are are a great example of that like there are like, plenty of the people who do who do weekly things that really fit into into who they are I'm like I'm still kind of trying to figure that out but in terms of what you're going to get from me I think it's pretty consistent that like I try to I try to think about things a lot I probably overthink things um I'm probably getting my own own way a little bit but for the most part like I'm trying to be thoughtful I'm trying to come in come in over the top and like really take a big picture look at things um and I try to you know I try to just get in my head and see like what the most interesting thing that hasn't been explored about a topic is or you know just you know what's you know what's sticking out and and take that little kernel and, and make it something bigger and hopefully that you know you're not always going to get there but hopefully that consistently produces enough unique content that Mm -hmm. people will know that they're going to get something good what's your (laughs) sorry what's your process like is it um um like is it very routine or is it like okay it's three in the morning i'll just write something right now what's that process like it depends because like right now everything's very routine because I think everything's very routine for everybody. We're all kind of waking up and having the same day over and over again, but it kind of depends. Like, you know, you'll be at a game, maybe you'll notice something and like that could be a day where you're writing a game story. It very much just depends on like what the assignment is. Um, for a feature, you know, you might, a, a lot, a, a, most of it, like I would say 80% of it comes from watching a game, noticing a little thing or even a big thing. And just trying to 
trying to blow that up into something bigger, trying to see if there's any themes going on, if there's anything that could say something larger about the league. Um, sometimes there isn't. Sometimes it's just one thing you notice, which is fine too. Like I, I think fans lo- like all that stuff as well. But for the most part, um, it's hard. To, it's hard to have a routine with something mm-hmm. when you're kind of just waiting for a mm-hmm. thing to come to you. But then once once it does. Uh, I I do get pretty regimented with it where like I'll try to like I'll try to compare it to past situations I love reading old basketball books Um, that's one thing I would say like just reading reading old history I I think or I guess that's a redundant term but um, like reading anything historical I think is very very useful I think people probably don't do it enough to be honest Uh, especially in basketball because as much as the sport has changed like one of the things I've noticed is that like all of the themes in terms of like personal conflict or like player, you know, there's always going to be a player that's, that's doing really well and a player that isn't and like the way that guys psychology works and like who gets down on themselves and like locker room dynamics, all that stuff is very repeating. And I think that you can learn a lot from all these books where, you know, right now we're in the present and we're not going to know everything about a situation because that's just how it works. And we'll find out 10 years down the road or whatever, but like, right. Like we'll see what, like we're seeing with the last dance right now. Right. Um, but you go back and read stuff and it's all out there in front of you. And like, you can really like see how the mechanisms behind the sport work. So like, I like to, I like to try to see if it, there's a historical comparison that can like either help, it, it helps inspire your idea, like flesh out the theme, see if like it it could be tied to other things that are happening in the present right now. It's also great to help you think of like, oh, like I should talk to this person or that person. To me, like the biggest thing is just like trying to make connections in my brain to flesh an idea out. And there's a million different ways that you can do that. But like, I've always found myself looking at pieces like, like at articles or movies or or any or anything that is slightly related to whatever I'm working on, whether it's thematically related or reminds me of it. Like I would say, like trust every hunch that's saying, like mm-hmm. you know, if if reading or like if if reading about a certain player or you know watching a certain play reminds you of a certain TV show or a movie or anything like that just like just go down that wormhole i think our minds are always making connections that like we see is random that we don't really investigate mm-hmm. that we that we should have you read the book range yeah yeah that's range where, that you're just summarizing exactly what i think he was talking about you know? yeah he does get into that he does get into that uh one of the other guys that like is this is one of the one of the best books that i've read about creativity is where good ideas come from by oh, Stephen johnson Okay, I'll put that on my list. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah. And he talks about neural networks and uh, how basically, you know, the more the more that you're taking in from different areas, um, the better ideas that, that you're going to have. And, like, it's kind of historically proven itself. But, like, the best ideas used to come from, come from cities because people were connecting with a lot of different types of subject matter and, like, different types of people in – like a, in, in a small place now with the internet you can do that all the time like you can you can watch stuff and read stuff about like 20 different topics in one day and mm-hmm. you might you might think that you're not really doing anything when you're doing that but you actually are in and that like, same, if you just sorry, trust that in that same respect and i've had trouble with this because i've written um I, we, we've made short films and i feel like a great writer um can write about anything and the fact that you are, sorry, uh, uh, like sort of adapting that idea from taking from everywhere, do you think that you're capable of writing about anything? Like if I was, if I was like, hey, Yahoo has this cricket assignment, you got to go watch the World Cup. Do you think you can learn enough to then regurgitate out the same thing in different industries? Yeah, I think it would be different just because you go in as an outsider. But yeah, I think so. I mean, I hope so. Um, I've started to kind of try that as you know there's no uh there's no basketball to cover right now so we're getting a little more into that and it's been fun it's been really interesting um Mm -hmm. and but i but i think so i think it's all about communication and like you know trusting your gut and making sure that you're researching everything and, and looking for interesting things um yeah like just research i think people people get stuck 
thinking that everything has been done that yeah. if something if something is popular it doesn't deserve a second look mm-hmm. because it's already been investigated and people have already said all there is to say about it i find that is never true mm-hmm. honestly like any any time you go into the wormhole of anything and like here's the best example of it um michael jordan's documentary right he was the most famous person in the world for like 10 straight years and you know 22 years have passed since that time and we're watching this documentary now and there is so much stuff coming up around it from people who are starting to have conversations with with people who were involved at that time who are now a way more open about things that were going on so we're learning more about that and also just looking at it from a different lens like younger people are asking questions that maybe people at the time wouldn't have thought to ask so like just never like never think that a topic is done if you're interested in it just like delve into it i totally agree i guess i, I, guess I get, like got away a little bit from what you were from what you were saying but i just like i really i really really strongly believe that but yeah like i think i think having that habit can apply to almost anything because at the, at, at the end of the day like what you're trying to do is understand something mm-hmm. and it, that can be sports or in like that can be, you know, you know, that could be like the coronavirus. Like, it's like look, like look at Bruce Arthur for example. The Toronto Star is basically like turned into, and he's a fantastic writer. Mm. Turned into basically a coronavirus writer yeah. after covering sports forever, right? Um, and, and, and I, I totally agree with that because even when, um, like, we were working on the startup idea, it's like sometimes we're fascinated with coming up with something so original that we don't look into gaps and stuff that already exists. So it's yeah. interesting you see it the same way with with writing. Um, how about networking? How do you tackle networking? That's something that I've struggled with, and I feel like that's really crucial being a reporter. How do you yeah. tackle, because I think there's a fine line between being an opportunist and then genuinely mm-hmm. being nice and networking. And uh, I think there's a really fine line. How do you tackle that? Well, it's tough. I think, I think that line is obviously um, a hard one to navigate. I try to look at it organically. Mm-hmm. Uh, just... In, in basketball, it's, it's uh, it, having a sport to talk about makes it easier, a sport that everybody likes. It's just like this natural way to break the ice. And it's also a way that you're kind of gathering information at the same time. Like me talking about basketball with like an agent or a scout could me is, is usually, it's usually just me talking about basketball because like we're talking about basketball. But like when you have conversations with people like that who are in the inside and have like more insight than you, like you're naturally learning things right and like you're kind of always like putting stuff in the back of your head but it is tough um especially you know like you know walking into an arena looking like me uh the first like the first little while it was it was very intimidating and it still is in certain instances like you i just moved to la so it's a like i got uh, very used to Toronto. I knew, I knew everybody in Toronto so like for me that at, at certain by the time I left it was like you know it was just like going to the arena there was like you know going just be just being at home right Mm -hmm. um but then you know moving here it's like you're kind of starting over again it's also different because it's staples center and it's like Mm -hmm. legitimate like you know celebrity presence and whatnot so um but it's just practice it's just reps i think like you get you get used to any setting that you're in you start to feel a little bit more comfortable and more like yourself you just got to keep going and i think uh just you know talking to people and, and just like remembering the they're like when you're dealing with like athletes and celebrities i think the thing is that you just have to remember that there's people too you know Mm -hmm. like if you talk to them like a normal person they will respond to you like a normal person but on the point of you know turning that into a professional relationship i think patience is huge like you never want to you never want to overstep um and uh you know like potentially ruin a relationship or like seem like you're 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 too uh single-minded about it like i think and i think i think the best way to do that is actually just try to come come from a genuine place with it and like assume that you're going to have meaningful relationships with the people that you meet Mm -hmm. and genuinely like care about what's going on in their lives right like i think uh I i think you can organically do some of the tougher parts uh when it comes to actually like having relationships with people, the hardest part for me has actually just been like getting in there and like developing those in the first, in the first place. Cause you're just like, you know, you're, you're walking and you're like, Oh, holy shit. Like, yeah. I'm like, what are I looking at? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, what do you think is wrong with sports journalism? Like, what's something that is very uh, encouraging for you? Other than the Reddit click clickbait stuff that we subscribe to, but. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I think we get into a hive mind sometimes. Like, I think, and I, I'm guilty of it uh, as much as anybody else, but, uh, like, I think oftentimes we start writing for each other and we get, like, stuck constantly talking to media, constantly talking to people in the league where, like, we kind of forget that this is for the fans and, like, there's a larger audience that doesn't care about a lot of the things that we're talking about. Like, Twitter is, Twitter is great because, you know, I mean, we know all the reasons that Twitter – is or was great like it's probably the only reason i have a have a career in basketball and like you can talk to a ton of people uh but at the same time it also like creates a consensus on certain things that i don't think should be a consensus and that's also a place where i think i think writers can or like any anybody anybody looking to work in a sport can take advantage of that like there will be certain players that like i don't i don't even know how it develops but like there will be like these like takes that become I can't even remember any right now because we haven't had any basketball but there's always like there's always some sort of take that becomes on the shake it fact off. because because yeah. every because like two smart people said it like you know like Zach like maybe Zach Lowe will say something and then somebody else will co-sign it and it's like awesome. it'll be like two exactly and like that's fair because like that's coming from a place of a lot of credibility but you also have to remember at the same time he's also just a guy watching basketball and like trying to trying to learn about it as well just like just like you uh you or me so just you know in, like investigate all of that stuff too like get out of the idea that like one person is this just because like people say that because like honestly like there are a lot of people who are doing a lot of great stuff but at the same time there's also there's also just a lot of people repeating what the great people are doing and that yeah. creates uh you know i guess that hive mind that i was talking about so i think that's probably that's probably one of the issues. And then the other one that I, that, that uh, has come up way more this year than any other year is that like when sports collide with real life, I find that people have a hard time having the right perspective on it again, because, you know, like just stuck in that, in that bubble. Uh, I think that happened with, uh, with uh, the China stuff, and it kind of happened with the coronavirus stuff. But luckily, there's also like one of the testaments to, to Twitter is that there's a lot of great voices out there too. So you can you can sift through it and like find the find the right take, but um, or like you know just get the right perspective. But yeah, I think I think uh, I think those are probably the two biggest issues I have with it. Do you think analytics is ruining sports writing and sports watching? Because now we can, like baseball, it's ruined because I can look at the box score and I can tell exactly what happened. I feel like basketball is approaching that and I feel like hockey is a step behind. Do you feel like we've gone way too far? Like Allen Iverson now is like mm -hmm. not as respected as he used to. Those are really yeah. bad shots, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and like guys like um, Ray Allen are much more respected. Uh, guys who are shooting or Steve Nash now is much more respected. Um, right. Do you feel like we're, we're diving too deep into with analytics? Well, I think sometimes when you go back and make historical judgments, you have to remember that that information wasn't available at that time. Yeah. But I also think there's been like, there's legitimately been some fair criticisms of the way that Alan Iverson played. Uh, but it does take away from the fun of it. Cause the fun of the, like the fun of AI was not that like, he was the most efficient player in the world. It was that he was fucking awesome because he wasn't, you know? I think that that's the thing that we lose. Like, sometimes I think we, we overcorrect. But I think, to me, analytics are great. Like, it's just one more way to, to watch the game, to learn more about the game. It's another perspective. And for fans, it's another tool to argue with. Like, it's mm -hmm. just, like, another set of numbers that you can throw into somebody's face when you're like, no, my player is better than yours. And all that stuff is great. Um, I think sometimes, like, people get lost in – considering the analytical take to be like the only correct take and the other thing is like we lose sight of things like chemistry and leadership and all these factors that like matter way more in a locker room than whether one guy is taking like 0 0.5 mid-range shots per game versus like 1.3 or whatever like that's that is obviously relevant in the long run um to your success but like we also need to look at the habits like why what why are those habits formed are those are those habits formed for psychological reasons like 
like whatever like analytics can identify a problem but they don't always solve a problem right mm -hmm. like that's that I think I think in the league most people most people do under like um, like everybody in the league I think understands that and they use they use the tools like pretty well to 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 try to build basketball teams but I think uh, I I think they can sometimes but like I don't know like for me like the way that I look at it is like people will try to use advanced stats to make an argument and act like that argument is like the end all be all mm -hmm. of whatever whatever uh you're talking about but we've always done that like before that we we did that with basic stats or we did it with rings or whatever like if pete like if somebody has a type like if somebody like really wants to be right that's just kind of the the approach that they're going to take to everything and that's just like a new tool for them that i guess sounds a little bit more credible than like whatever tool they're using before but like for anybody that wants to like really understand like it's just it's one more thing that that helps and you know, like any piece of information, it's always good to put it in context. Like you can, I think you can go far, too far down the web with any, any, uh, anything that you're looking at and saying like, oh, okay, well, this guy is this and therefore like he's bad, right? Like it's always about like looking at like, okay, like he is efficient, but you know, maybe he's not very nice to his teammates or vice versa or whatever. Like just putting, putting all that stuff into a full picture is I think, uh, the most productive possible thing that you can do but because it's new and because it's numbers i think it comes with this uh this certainty behind it that sometimes it doesn't earn mm -hmm. what about the whole um in hockey this is a big thing and it might be in basketball it is in basketball mm -hmm. also but things that you can't identify with numbers the intangibles like for example this guy's a choke choke artist mm -hmm. or does he have the heart to win yada 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 is that stuff that's just media hype or do you feel like those are actual things that you can visually see or feel when you're there no i think it's very real um and i think that's one of the places where we where we get like a little too stuck in in thinking analytically um i don't even know if that's the right term like i'm thinking analytically is always good <laughs> um but you know for example here's one like the idea that whatever happens in the first quarter is just as important as what happens in the fourth quarter because, you know, it's just like a possession is not worth yeah. more in the fourth quarter, yeah. technically. Yeah. Cool. Like, cool story, yeah. bro. Like, what, like you want to enter the world now, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, like, and of course it matters more. And it's also, there's also an analytical tick for why it matters more. Like, there's a mathematical, like, anything you do in the fourth quarter matters more because you have less time to make up for it mm -hmm. towards the end. Anyway, like that's like, there's, there's stuff like that. Um, there's the idea that choking is not a thing is just like, guys, like, what are we doing? These are at the end of the day, like these are human beings that are playing the game. Um, if somebody has a psychological predilection to overthink when they're under pressure, which many, many people do, it's pretty normal yeah that might affect affect how they play and like players have, have talked about that like they there's a great jackie mcmullen story on espn from i think two years ago or, or one year ago where she talked to athletes about how they deal with like you know maybe their heart starts racing when you know they're they know that they might be up for a game winning shot or something in a timeout and, like a ton of scenarios like that where they know it's a big moment and and they find ways to to self-regulate mm -hmm. um whether that's with breathing or like whatever they whatever they've developed for themselves to calm themselves down. So when you look at things like that, then it's like, well, I mean, even the athletes know that that's happening. And I think the place that we get lost with analytics is that like just because something can't be proven with numbers doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, like we see it with a hot hand. Like there's always been a debate. Like does a hot hand exist? And like anybody that's ever picked up a basketball will tell you it exists. Yeah. Like it that totally my pick up exists. Career. That's my pickup career. Like, <laughs> yeah, right. Like and, and like yeah, I get that. Like sometimes like you think you have a hot hand, and you take a bad shot, or like whatever. Like the hot hand exists, guys. Like that's there's certain things that we're, it's like they're so self evident that you don't need to you don't need to pretend that they're not real like and, and investigate it i think it's interesting to investigate like the impact of thinking that you're hot and all that stuff but um i don't know like we don't have to get so far into it that we stop like 
we, we stop thinking about these things that are that have always been like really integral to the sport and very clearly exist right um where do you see how do you see sports journalism shifting the next five years because obviously twitter's had a big impact the last 10 years i feel like reddit has actually had one of the biggest impacts in the last five years because now it's everything's curated and not yeah. so much that a bad piece is like downvoted so i'm getting like the best of the best um yeah what do you see sports journalism looking like five years from now Oh uh, man, if you if you have any good predictions, please let me know so I can start. Said, yesterday, yesterday, uh, our buddy said he's a Queens Park journalist. He said TikTok, like, TikTok might be the thing where people are consuming news through TikTok. I mean, yeah, probably. Like it'll be one more platform to to do it. And I think I don't think that's I don't think that's a bad thing. I think actually TikTok is uh it can be incredibly creative and tell like like people talk like tell like it's crazy. Yeah. yeah like they'll like tell a story with like real pathos in like 45 seconds you know and I'm, like, yeah. I'm like wow that was really like so it's interesting um but i don't know like yeah obviously like that's that's probably going to be part of it um especially with the nba like the way the highlights are consumed like it's just kind of perfect for it so yeah i definitely see that that being one thing but to me that like that's just another platform i don't know if that's like a dictate a larger future you know mm -hmm. what i mean um but I don't know, honestly, like before, before the coronavirus crisis hit, it seemed like podcasting just couldn't really, you can't get enough of it. Like what people that are listening was going up. And I imagine that, you know, I mean, who knows what the world is going to look like, but if it's any, you know, any semblance of the same in terms of like everybody's commuting all the time and they're like, you know, taking in passive content. Um, I think I think podcasting will continue to to grow a ton, mm -hmm. um, but I don't know. It's it's honestly I, I hate making predictions about it because we're never right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, uh, especially with the coronavirus stuff, it's like nothing's the truth. Um, okay, so now I want to shift uh, away from journalism and more into like uh, like perception and principles and perspective. Um, who do you think of when you uh, hear the word successful? Oh man! By a lot of people. And why is it Tony Allen? <laughs> why is it Tony Allen? Um, I mean, a lot of people pop up into my head. It probably changes day day to day. Oh, that's um, awesome. Sorry. That that that's awesome. Why do you think it changes day to day? It's like, is there some different things that you admire day to day, or? I mean, I uh, yeah, I guess like just like whatever you're doing that day, or like whoever you're thinking about. Um, obviously, sports people like right now, like honestly, like first person that popped in my head was my dad and then like rightly um, so right yeah just yeah. kind of like yeah <laughs> he so figured some shit out. There. Yeah. yeah he figured he figured some shit out uh, yeah. so uh and then i don't know like like steph curry for okay. some reason charles barkley like I, and that's also like it's it, that's because like i've been thinking about those two people for the last sure uh, the dream on the dream on thing so. It's probably yeah, they, yeah. yeah um, it was. It is because the Draymond thing, actually. Yeah. What is it about them three? Because I'm sure Charles and your dad don't have a great three point shot, but maybe Charles and your dad rebound real well. But what is it about them three that, like, admire you admire a ton that you feel like is? Uh, I'm sure it's different things that you find. Um, okay, cool. This is why this this person is successful. Oh, I think I think I think my dad pops up for me because he's my dad, you know. I think like yeah. you know, your parents popping up for you in that moment is pretty uh it's pretty normal. But I think uh I think trying to find the right perspective on life and like okay. and, and and searching. Because I think I think obviously there are a ton of successful people in the world. There are lots of people that we look to as like icons of what we should be aspiring to. Like we're watching, we're all obsessed with the Michael Jordan documentary right now um but at the same time working in sports has given me an interesting perspective where there are some very very successful people who are at the top of their craft and they're utterly miserable yeah so i don't know i'm always kind of trying to have the like trying to find the right perspective especially now on on like how much of your life you should be devoting to your craft versus not i guess and i think if you want to do it all the way that's great too like you know fully you know explore 
whatever it is that you're doing and, and like really dive into it. Cause I think like moments like that, where you're really, really like in the weeds of something and like really like creating something or like just at the top, like uh, feeling like feeling like that, like feeling like you're on the edge of something is just like, it's like euphoric, like in anything that you do. And it's like the hot hand, right? Like it just, you know, when you, when you're doing anything, you feel like you're just like in a flow like that that is totally like worth chasing but at the same time like i don't know there's got to be you notice that there's a line and the Mm -hmm. fact that like so many successful people are opening up more and more about like depression anxiety and like any number of mental health issues i think um you know it just made me stop and think about stuff like that you know especially like on on twitter and and instagram and it's just really it's it's really easy I think to get caught up in this idea that you have to like maybe and maybe this is too specific but this is just something that I personally think about a lot is like it's really easy to get caught up in this idea that you have to like turn your entire like self into content in order to be successful Mm -hmm. um and like people have now been doing that for long enough that we're seeing some of the the downsides of it. So I'm just like, I don't know, I'm constantly kind of trying to figure out where the line is, of like, like what's appropriate and what's not, what's good for you, like mentally and what's not. Um, and probably none of it is really, but, you know, living in the actual world, like trying to find that line. But like, the re- like the reason that like a guy like Charles popped up is like, he seems happy and he like didn't really have like, you know, he's obviously had a ton of like traditional success in his life, like going from where he was to like then being a professional basketball player and now, you know, still being a very successful commentator. Um, but you know, didn't win a ring. Um, which in basketball is like, you know, that's the mm-hmm. biggest thing. Um, and is seems super chill about it, right? And like I think that's kind of the right perspective to have is to like remember that like even even though you know, you lost at something like you're still you're still a winner. I think I think for my dad that I have that same sort of. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. I think I think those things kind of connect in that way. Where you know, I don't know if I should be. Uh, yeah, this is fine. Um, like you know, like so with, like with my dad losing, it was really interesting to watch him. Like I'll give some comment. My dad's a politician. Yeah. Um, he lost this past election for. The first election he has lost since winning, uh, w- uh, winning uh, his seat as a councilman in um, 2007. Yeah, 2007. So yeah, he he'd been riding a wave for a long time of, of just constant success, and uh, you know this time this time he he lost and it was the first time in a long time that he's like really had to take an L like that and it's also it's a tougher L because it is like a popularity contest yeah and uh you know he had some he he had some you know struggles with it as anybody would I think but um like I've really just admired the way that he waded into it and is like tried to you know instead of instead of being like depressed about it i think he's done a lot of things to you know have the right perspective on it he's been journaling reading more spending a ton of time with my mom spending a ton of time with like my cousin and stuff like that and like really you know helping people out in my family who need help and like just being there for the people around in his life around him in a way that he wasn't really able to before all of this um so like i don't know just I, I guess like I just I don't know for me like that was it was just really cool to see that side of him um where you know for my entire life it's really just been like up and up and up and being like the guy like it was always like oh your gets always out your gets always out like right yeah. ahead just been like it was such a small world small Indian community um so just like seeing him like you know like then that that does become part of your identity right so seeing him lose that and just be able to main, maintain perspective and like look at the upside of all of that and just say like okay like yeah this is like the time to like focus on other things has been like cool um so he's being like more proactive than reactive is that fair to say um, i mean like the initial thing is obviously like yeah you kind of have to be just reactive right but you know i, th- I think 
he didn't really like he tried to maintain perspective of like what it is that he started being in it for as, as well like at, at the end of the day like it's a democracy and you know it's yeah. never it's never you know it's never right that you get to serve it's a pri- it's a privilege i think you know he tried to just remember that at all times and just uh you know be grateful for the for the time that he was able to do it you know, I have an interesting question, and it could tie back to both you and your your dad. Is mm-hmm. like, let's say you write a really great piece, right? And it goes, and I don't know, I don't know what validation looks like, um, or means to a journalist. But let's say it goes viral and well mm-hmm. respected. Are you constantly chasing that? Like, even with your your dad is a super popular MP, right? Mm-hmm. And for him, like a part of it, in a pardon me if I'm putting words into his mouth, but it might be like, yo, that was my peak. Like that was incredible. Um, is he, maybe he had to come to terms with the fact that, okay, that's not my peak, you know, it'll be something else. Are you constantly also chasing that great piece or are you now aware enough to be like, okay, cool, every piece is its own project? Well, for him, I don't think it was a, it was as much of a a conscious understanding of that. Um, because he was just always working all the time. It was always go, 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 go. And I think he did get a lot of validation that he probably didn't realize he was getting. Mm-hmm. at the time so there was a bit of like oh okay so this is like not gonna be a thing anymore but I think I think for him like he was just like he, I don't think it bothered him that much I don't think it was ever really like what he was in it for but you do I mean any like you're a human being you do notice when you are a highly complimented person who's yeah. stopping being yeah. complimented yeah. <laughs> so uh, you know you obviously notice but like for, for me and uh, you try you try to get away from it because I think um, I think the way to do a good job at, at it is to not think about stuff like that. But it's inevitable, and like mm-hmm. it's hard not to. It's like we all we all live in like Twitter. Like Twitter, in a lot of ways, is like if you're a journalist, it's a community that you live in. So like you're natural, like biologically, like you're just, there's part of you that's always just gonna want to get like gratification from it, right? But mm-hmm. I try to be conscious of it and it's funny like that stuff has always existed because i don't know this this is really interesting to me because like i think we look at all this stuff as very modern but i was reading i was reading uh the best of the brightest by david halberstrom it was a mm-hmm. uh, book about um the vietnam war and it was written i i pro- probably came out in the mid 70s um but in his introduction to the book he's talking about how you know as a newspaper writer and like, well, this is not a guy who's like, you know, pumping it out every day. He was like mm-hmm. doing like, you know, I don't, I don't know how how much, how many times he was publishing, but he was like, he was a long form writer. Um, and he, as he's writing this book, he's talking about this struggle to, you know, balance out the fact that like he's got this big thing coming up with <laughs> the fact that he's not getting instant gratification for the things that he's writing. Wow. And I'm like, oh, like, okay, so David Halberstrom, the best historian, like, like the 20th century for, like, as far, at least as, like, as far as America goes, um, in the 70s, and, like, in the 60s while he's writing this, is feeling like this. Mm-hmm. It was just really interesting to me, because we look at all of this stuff as, like, you know, like, instant gratification is this mm-hmm. new term that we have, we're, that we're coming into right now because of of Instagram and, and Twitter and like people kind of putting themselves out there in order to get likes and retweets and all that stuff. And, and well, I mean, like, I was funny. I was like, Oh, this has always existed. Always just, and, yeah, that's and, like, this, and this person who like, you know, wrote the best account of, I mean, all, the last dance comes from Halberstam. Like that's, it's basically like the first two, ep- the first two episodes were basically like his book. Right. Mm-hmm. So, um, it's, yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. That's, that's probably, uh, digression that doesn't answer your question very much but i think no, you're always I, like no, that's the point I, is that you're always 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 struggling with that and like you're always just trying to be on the right side of it how do you deal with um do you work on mental health then like on your own mental health oh for sure for sure all the time like what, i like to do like do? um like i try to like i i have it back on now just like i realized that it just wasn't really like working for my job but for a while i deleted i deleted the twitter app from my phone oh wow um, that's yeah cool. yeah it wasn't it just like i, I like, just for my job like, i just realized i couldn't do it like it was it was getting too unproductive yeah there were things i needed to know about like faster than i found out about them unfortunately but 
that was nice for a bit. Um, Why did you, why did you delete like, it? Why delete? Sorry? Why did you delete Twitter? I mean, why, why, why would you not delete Twitter? <laughs> well, see, yeah, I, I, yeah, I guess, yeah, I get it. It's, <laughs> but the thing is, is, is it that, is it, do, do you not, is it, okay, for the reason I would delete Twitter is, also, I feel like Twitter's curated, right? So for me, it's a left-wing perspective that I've curated. Yeah. So I'm following people that I like, so I get to see the yeah. terrible stuff much less often than you would, because I got Bruce yeah. Arthur, I got Zach, I got you, so it's like a left-wing I'm not saying you're a left wing, but yeah, you might be because your father is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. so, so, <laughs> so for me, it's curated. For you, is it responses? Is that why? Was that getting way too much? That's part, part of it. Like, definitely. You just don't want to, like, whether it's good or bad, like, you don't want to get too caught up in that. And, like, the, it's also like the bad stuff never, I mean, the good stuff never feels as good as the bad stuff feels bad. So it's yeah. like, you're never, you're never really going to, like, win that. Uh, win that battle with yourself um but also just like more the use of it like the constant like you're just you find yourself checking it and, like the habitual thing of like you know, um, scroll 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 whatever and like it's just such a time suck and it doesn't feel good and then like you do it and you feel a little bit useless after it was more it was more about my own personal habits and things that i that than uh than things that i was getting in my mentions because like yeah. even now like when i'm having twitter like my mentions are very filtered and, like that's why like if i if I don't respond to you and you said something like normal, it's probably because I didn't see it. Cause it's just like, I've, I've that cut it up to the point where like, if like, it's really only like people who like know me that, that like, I'll actually see like what they say to me, which helps uh, mm -hmm. a ton with, uh, with how you use it. But like, yeah, that's one thing. I mean, I like to meditate. Um, I just like, I mean, obviously as a writer, you're kind of always in your head. You're always like, you're always like almost too much having a sense of like where, where you stand. Um, but that has a lot of benefits too. Like it allows you to, it allows you to like filter stuff out and like get stuff out that probably needs to get there. But like, yeah, I try to do a ton of different meditation stuff and like yoga and, and stuff, just to like balance myself out. What's the purpose of your meditation? Because I've had like this conflicting view on it. Like sometimes, like a lot of people say med that the true meditation is um, sort of getting rid of all thought in your head and. Yeah. Uh, um, being away from the world, whereas some people argue that it's it's sitting down for a bit and being aware of what's going on in your head and sort of accepting accepting that. How does yeah. what's meditation like for you? Like, what's that practice like? So I'll do. I mean, for like just to answer your question outright, like I have anxiety and I just I mm -hmm. do it because I have to, and I'm just like mm -hmm. get it to its normal like equilibrium point. Um. But like, there's there's a ton of different kinds that you can do, and I, I don't know, it's weird. Like, I see people arguing about what meditation is, and I'm just like, guys, this is so not the point. <laughs> like, this is this is completely antithetical to what you should be. Anyway, like, so um, like I think there's certain types that are just straight up like anxiety reducers that probably like maybe they shouldn't be defined as meditation, but I'll. I'll do stuff like that, especially like if things are really ramping up or like I know they might based on like whatever like might be happening in the future. Um, like so those like those are like way more guided and specific. But there's also like, you know, there's a guy named um Naval, I don't know his last name. Like, he's like, yeah, yeah. No, he's dope. Yeah. Sir? He's he's dope. Yeah, yeah. So like he he just says like, you know, like Sit there sit for there, like two hours. Six, yeah. yeah, sit there. Yeah, sit there still for like like sixty minutes, which is also wow. great. Like, yeah. like I've, I I've, I've tried that one, and like they all give you different things. I think like if I do like a guided guided meditation just to like, you know, get my anxiety down, it usually does the trick, and it's way more like it's way more in your head, and it's way more about your breathing and like getting into your feelings. So what is it like, called? Like analyzing what you're like. Oh, like I was just I like oh, I can send you. I can send you a link after. There's no like specific name for it. Like there's just oh. like a guy that like yeah. Um, but like it's way more like actually like you know feeling what's in your body and like feeling like the pain that's in your body and like trying to like if you feel it like it'll go away basically is what like just like yeah. just face it essentially. And it's it's kind of like it's more like a fear based like face your fears like fear like there's something that you're being avoidant about like you know just try to like sit that sit down and examine like why that is and what's going on. Um, like just check like it's more of like a check-in sort of thing i guess then like the thing that Naval does is very different like i think that one's more like okay like just let any thought that you have um flow 
and like let it go, which I think those are two very different types of meditation. Mm-hmm. And I don't really care how they're defined as like whatever. I think they're all effective, you know. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I'll do I'll do all of those really. Uh, oh, I'm, like, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I have a few more uh, questions in the quick some quick rapid fire, and then we're done. Um, what role does um, our um, your South Asian community or culture play in your in your life or your career? Um, yeah, I think, I think for me, like, it, it probably p- plays more of like the, like, I, I don't know, I'm not like actively, I'm not very religious. Mm-hmm. So that probably defines a lot of it. But like, at the same time, culturally, like most of my friends are Indian, I'm close to my parents, my family, and like, I am family oriented. And like, um, I don't know, it's hard to say, like, it's actually been interesting for me to notice that like over the past few months I started uh I started dating a white guy uh, just talking <laughs> the background a little bit for like the first time ta- the first time in my life ever and it's been interesting because um you notice things about you that are different culturally that you've never even realized because you've always been around the same people mm-hmm. and you're like oh yeah okay wait that's actually defined by like Sikhism or like whatever um, mm-hmm. but the biggest thing for me I think is like um like just like the way that my parents are they try like they're not they're not religious but they they try to like my like when, when growing up my mom always told me that like whatever it is like you should just try to take the best out of like anything because like there's you know, there's good and bad to, there's good and bad to, the, like, culturally, the way that we are is, like, as Desi people, like, there's a lot of great stuff. I think it's amazing how family-oriented we are. Mm-hmm. Um, we live in, like, very tight-knit communities, which, like, as we all know, is a double-edged sword. Like, when I go back home to Edmonton, it's really nice, like, especially living in a place like Toronto or, like, or LA, where, you know, I don't walk around and, like, really know anybody, but, like, when I go back home, like, there's, like, I live, it's funny actually so i live in a crescent where like everyone is indian Mm -hmm. and the next crescent everyone is indian and like my my family lives two doors down and then like that more family living in the other crescent like it's it's like being a spin you know Mm -hmm. um and like there's it's funny like we live on set like i live uh like, like the main road is 17th street and um the uh like the plaza beside it is actually called Sector 17 after oh, like wow. se- Sector 17 yeah. and Jimmy So it's yeah. like, you're like in the trap when you're yeah, when yeah. back home in Edmonton, right? Which is cool. Like, it's great. Like, you know, you go, you go out, like you're, you're, you're liable to like run into people, you know, and it feels very communal. And I think it's really special. Um, mm-hmm. But at the same time, like you get so like, if you grow, if you stay in the place, in a place that like you grew up in, forever like you kind of get stuck in old patterns and i think it's like hard to grow because you're around the same people who like knew you as a kid like maybe when you were a kid you were like like shy or like whatever and like all of that stuff like like carries with you forever and like your reputation like carries with you forever and like people get way more conscious of what they're doing and i think they don't try new things because they're always like worried about what people will think um and like that that stuff is like again like there's good and bad out of it um Mm -hmm. that like i've noticed in myself like when i moved like i always i always thought that i was i always i always thought that like i was making like individualistic choices if that makes sense i always thought that i was like you know like following my own path um and i guess and like on the you know in context i was right and like I, I moved and all that stuff but then like when I moved I realized that like I was still way more influenced by like you know the whole like what are people going to say about whatever and it like the kind of like the like the oh, thing that you can fall into yeah. like you know you guys know what it is like you guys yeah. understand um then then I even realized because I was like around people who were like all like that they all move and they're all like you know trying to like go get something and like I was like oh wait yeah like I I still had like a ton of work to do in terms of like you know shedding that that switch that's always like mm-hmm. in the back of your head um which is like that's one of the negatives but there's so many positives like I think I think that like um it's me it makes it's made me very compassionate or like not very i think i'm probably not I, I, like there are people in my life who are much more compassionate than i am but like being around them is like 
definitely definitely rubbed off on me um mm-hmm. so like yeah there's just it's it's way more i think for me cultural than it is anything else but like it mm-hmm. totally it totally informs a lot of my habits like i think it informs the way i look at politics for sure like i think i think uh i think sicky is something like, like i think it's i think it's naturally like a leftist yeah the leftist ethos that I definitely carry with me, despite despite like not being religious, like just yeah, like the concept of Lunga and Seba and all that stuff is just like it's so it's so deep in you, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I have uh, a few rapid fire questions, and we're good to go. Um, um, you you mentioned uh, three four books, but are there is there a couple of particular books that have impacted your life significantly? You said uh, uh, so- Steve Johnston was it? Or, uh, Stephen Johnston. Or- where good ideas come from. Mm-hmm. Is, that a, is that one a fair one to say that is impacted your life significantly? Or are there other ones? Yeah, for sure. Like I ended, I ended up reading a ton of his books after that, just because like I just love the way that he looks at the world and like structures and stuff like that. I would reckon like he's just a really fun writer, and I think like it's informed the way that I look at look at basketball and like plays and like how ideas develop like in the sport as well. So like yeah, definitely more more professionally than personally that one, but yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, are there any other books that you've mentioned? Um, I think recently. Um, I'm always reading all the time, but like, I mean, I've read, like, I, I don't know if anything recently is like stuck out as much, but like, the problem is like, I know I have good answers to this, but like, I just can't. It's all right. Uh, you can give them, to, give them to us later and we'll add them. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, that 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 works. I'll like go through Kindle um, or something. And, like, there, yeah, I mean, Range was like Range was a book that I uh, read, and like it made me feel a lot better about like my path and yeah, like same here. Yeah, especially yeah. with sports writing, there's so much uncertainty. That book is great because I think I think like and I gave it I gave it to some of my my younger cousins who are like you know in, in university or like thinking about stuff like that. And I, yeah. And like, cause they like, I feel like the younger generation just like thinks about school and like their future way more than we we, we did. Like, I felt like a very passive decision maker mm-hmm. when I was at, when I was that age. It was like all my friends are going to U of A, so I will go to U of A. Um, and like, they're just like they they think about this stuff, which is is really good, but also like I think really anxiety inducing. So I said I gave I gave that book to uh, to some of them and. Uh, it's great because it's like it's like a fact-based way of telling you you are okay in what you're doing professionally right um and that like that that is like a book that i think everybody should read but i also think everybody is reading it because it's like it's blown up so which is good good um but I yeah know, I, I was know. a big gladwell i was a big gladwell guy and the whole ten thousand hour thing freaked me out Cause I'm like, I can't like, cause it's Tiger Woods against Roger Federer. That's so, like, you know what? Maybe I'll just be Federer. I'm fine with being Federer. I don't have to be Tiger Woods. So I think it was, it was <laughs> it's super helpful. Um, how about a quote? Are there certain quotes that you re- you re- revisit daily or weekly that you feel like are encouraging or inspirational? Um, I probably, in terms of quotes, I probably look more, I uh, think about stuff more personally, especially like, just like, you know, being anxious and things like that. I like the thing I'm always trying to remind myself is just like, be nice to myself. Yeah. Um, especially like, you know, when you're making stuff and you're driven and like, you want to excel, like all that stuff is good, but it's just like also good to, to breathe and like, remember that you're fine you're fine if you fail, you're fine if you don't, like, you know, take the next step or, like, whatever and all that stuff. Um, so, yeah, yeah, just that. I don't think there's anything, like, in terms of, like, the way that I look at the world that, I don't know, if that makes mm-hmm. sense. Um, what's your, what's something, what would you say is your most valuable purchase? What's something My that, most valuable. yeah. Oh, that's interesting. That's a good question. My most valuable purchase. Um, like, what do you, like, in terms of, like for me, it'd be my Matt Sandine jersey. Oh, that, okay. That's, that's God. That's God. That's God. <laughs> um, hmm, that's interesting. That's a good question. I'm like looking around right now. Uh, probably, I mean, like probably the most valuable purchase I ever got was like getting a guitar because I think that just opened me up creatively. Oh, really? 
Yeah, like I've never ended up being like amazing at playing it, but it it got me down just like the road of like making stuff and and like re- like I started like writing writing lyrics to to songs and stuff, which was really the first time I ever had written anything. Mm-hmm. And I think that probably eventually like took me down this path. Wow, that's a great answer because a lot of people give really super personal answers that you can't really like an engagement ring like yeah sure right that's what i want right, yeah. me my mats and dean jersey can't do anything with it but that's interesting um the last question is if there are three or two or three south asians that you feel like would be great for this project that we should contact um who would they be um can i think about that sure like i mean there's like yeah there's tons right like but like you know yeah, yeah of course of yeah course you um that's it. This is awesome. This is really, really good. Um, I think a lot of um, the answers that you gave are, are would be super, super helpful for people who eventually read our book or listen to this interview. So thank you so yeah, much. For I'm, I'm, glad. I'm glad. If you guys need anything else, let me know. Awesome. And the community is, uh, uh, well, I, I speak for the community and just for us, like, super proud of what you're doing. And um, I, I think it's awesome. I think it's awesome. So Thanks. Congratulations. I it, and I hope the LA, do you just move to LA? Yeah, like two months ago. So will you be covering just the Lakers and Clippers exclusively? exclusively? Uh, no, I'll cover the whole league, uh, oh but, God. yeah. Yeah, you're going to have to cover the Lakers. Yeah, this would have been a yeah. great year because they probably would have won the championship. Or it would have been, yes. But, yeah, I, we wish you luck. <laughs> Thank you so much Thanks. for coming on, Tita.